Hey everyone, and thanks for taking the time to check out this video. For today's viewer requested presentation, we are turning our attention to 18 United States Code 922R and using plain English to explain exactly how it does and does not apply to the private ownership and modification of SKS pattern carbons. I'll try to keep this video short and sweet, but before we dive in, we gotta rattle off four quick disclaimers. First, the subject of today's video is United States federal law, and therefore this will probably be of near exclusive interest to US residents. Second, I am not a lawyer and nothing in this video represents legal advice. In this and all other legal matters, I encourage my viewers to consult multiple sources and better yet, take time to read the law for yourself. Third, today we're talking about 922R exclusively as it applies to the assembly or modification of import firearms by private citizens for personal use. We are not talking about 922R as it applies to importers or other business entities modifying firearms for commercial purposes. If you're an importer or dealer who's going on YouTube instead of retaining actual legal counsel, God help you. Fourth and finally, my intention in making this video is to honor a viewer request by explaining this law as it is written, and that is all. Unlike the US federal government, I am not in the business of telling adults how to live their lives. If you wanna carry on in the comments about compliance or non-compliance, you're more than welcome to, but please remember, I'm not the one telling you to do anything. That's neither my business nor my concern. All right, disclaimers are done, so let's get right down to it. 18 United States Code 922R states that it shall be unlawful for any person to assemble from imported parts any semi-automatic rifle or any shotgun which is identical to any rifle or shotgun prohibited for importation under section 925D3 of this chapter as not being particularly suitable for or readily adaptable to sporting purposes. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, it means a lot less than you might think, or rather it's missing a lot of critical context. 922R is statutory law, and therefore it really doesn't provide a lot of the information which is relevant for people like you and I. In order to understand exactly what this is saying and how it applies, we need to turn our attention over to regulatory law, specifically the Code of Federal Regulations. Before we do that, however, let's just translate what little we know so far. 922R cites a different piece of US code, that was 925D3, and this is where we find a statutory restriction on the importation of firearms which are not particularly suitable or readily adaptable to sporting purposes. This establishes that certain types of firearms are unlawful to import into the United States, even if those firearms are otherwise perfectly legal to own, use, and transfer. Exactly what defines sporting versus non-sporting weapons is a little bit complex and ultimately beyond the scope of this video, but I'll share my little trick just so you get the idea. Picture a tweed jacket wearing, meerschaum pipe smoking hunter prowling his personal estate in search of quail. If you can picture that guy holding a particular weapon, the federal government probably considers it to be sporting. If by contrast, the weapon actually looks cool and potentially capable of filling in multi-purpose practical roles, and therefore would look out of place in Lord Yorkshire's hands, it's probably verboten for import. In any case, the whole point of 922R is to prevent people from circumventing this import ban by simply assembling imported parts into firearms which would not have otherwise been legal to import. If you'll indulge in some more silly imagery, imagine for a second that the United States is Burger King, and the rest of the world is McDonald's, and you as a Burger King employee, AKA a US citizen, decide that you want a McDonald's Happy Meal, a product of a foreign country. No disrespect to Burger King shift supervisors, by the way, but in this case, you're gonna be playing the role of the US federal government. Despite the fact that Burger King will happily sell you their own version of a kid's meal, you want a McDonald's Happy Meal. So your supervisor passes 925D3, which states that you are not allowed to buy a Happy Meal from McDonald's. After further consideration, he also passes 922R, which states that while he can't prohibit you from possessing a McDonald's burger, fries, apple slices, and a toy, you are not allowed to put those ingredients together in a little red box and call it a Happy Meal. It's a lot like that, except with guns. All right, so now that we have hopefully a functional understanding of the intention behind the statute, let's switch over to looking at regulatory law, specifically 27 Code of Federal Regulations 178.39, and here we can see a more useful articulation of exactly what is prohibited. No person shall assemble a semi-automatic rifle or any shotgun using more than 10 of the imported parts listed in paragraph C of this section, 
if the assembled firearm is prohibited for importation under section 925D3 as not being particularly suitable for or readily adaptable to sporting purposes. The provisions of this section shall not apply to, and I'm skipping a few exceptions here and reading only the one that's relevant to us today. Three, the repair of any rifle or shotgun which had been imported into or assembled in the United States prior to November 30th, 1990, or the replacement of any part of such firearm. Lastly, we need to jump to paragraph C, which lists the 20 qualifying imported parts, and those are one, frames or receivers, two, barrels, three, barrel extensions, four, mounting blocks, aka trunnions, five, muzzle attachments, six, bolts, seven, bolt carriers, eight, operating rods, and nine, gas pistons, 10, trigger housings, 11, triggers, 12, hammers, 13, sears, 14, disconnectors, 15, butt stocks, 16, pistol grips, 17, forearms and hand guards, 18, magazine bodies, 19, followers, and 20, floor plates. All right, so now we've got some more concrete details to work with, but it's all still a little complicated, so let's break that part down into plain English. To that end, we'll return to our Burger King metaphor from earlier. All of a sudden, you, the Burger King employee, have a clever idea of how you can get your hands on that forbidden Happy Meal. You know you can't just buy a Happy Meal, and you can't assemble a Happy Meal of your own, but what if you substitute six of the French fries and one of the apple slices with ingredients you sourced from within Burger King? Is that a way you can get a perfectly legal and mostly satisfying Happy Meal? The short answer is yes, and 178.39 breaks down exactly where that line is drawn. Returning to the realm of firearms, 178.39 defines which and how many imported components need to be present for a firearm to magically transform, in the eyes of the law, from a U.S.-made firearm, which incorporates several foreign-made components, to a foreign-made weapon assembled in violation of federal import law. Conceptually, this is all very, very stupid, but at least there's a clearly defined standard. Now let's take everything we've learned and finally apply it to the SKS. Being that the SKS is a military weapon system, things aren't looking immediately promising for it in terms of it being deemed particularly suitable or readily adaptable to sporting purposes. Obviously, in reality, the SKS is extremely well suited for a wide range of sporting and non-sporting purposes, but remember the federal standard is really more based on abstraction than logic. This is the same standard that places a huge emphasis on features like bayonet lugs, let alone intact folding bayonets. After all, the continental United States has enjoyed very low rates of bayonet charges, at least since the Civil War, and the federal government is very serious about keeping it that way. All jokes aside, in this case, the military provenance of the SKS is actually a benefit from an importation perspective, as CNR military surplus rifles are actually exempt from all of the laws we've gone over so far, at least as long as they retain their curio and relic status. In other words, if an SKS pattern carbine has CNR status and remains in a historically accurate configuration, it is not subject to the parts count or rules we've just gone over. Conveniently, most SKS patterns have CNR designation. All firearms manufactured 50 or more years ago to the day earn CNR status automatically, which means that all Soviet and Romanian SKS patterns qualify. Not all Yugoslavian and Albanian rifles are quite 50 years old yet. However, these variants are both listed by name on the ATF's officially published CNR list, which means that all Yugo and Albanian variants have CNR status whether or not they're 50 years old. Really, the only common variant of SKS pattern that does not have CNR status are later Chinese examples. This video is being filmed in 2023, which means that at this time, any Chinese SKS manufactured in or before 1973 is a CNR, and all those manufactured later are not. Obviously, if you're watching this video in the future, that cutoff will have moved forward. Just as a fun example, this 1972 production Type 56 carbine was not a CNR item when I acquired it years ago, but it just became a CNR last year while in my possession. That said, there were a ton of Chinese SKS patterns manufactured between 1973 and 1990, so there are still tons of examples that won't get CNR status anytime soon, like this 1979 M21, for example. So why is this rifle, despite not being a CNR item, not subject to those parts counts, you ask? Well, luckily enough, there is another exemption specified by 178.39, which states that its provisions do not apply to the repair or parts replacement of any firearm imported or assembled prior to November 30th, 1990. Also known as pre-bans, this category basically covers all remaining Chinese SKS patterns, as in order for a non-CNR military configuration Chinese SKS pattern to have lawfully entered the country, it pretty much would have had to do this prior to that date anyway. That said, like the exemption based on CNR status, the exemption based on pre-ban status is also contingent on configuration. Specifically, these rifles must remain configured as they were imported or as they were configured prior to November 30th, 1990. 
In other words, most military configuration SKS patterns are not subject to import restriction based parts counts because essentially 100% of them are exempted due to CNR status, pre-band status, or in many cases, both. That said, both of these exemptions are only intact so long as the rifle remains in an approved configuration, which in most situations is gonna be the original military configuration. So here's where we get to the crux of the video. Let's say you have an SKS pattern and for whatever reason, you wanna modify it into a configuration that doesn't enjoy CNR or pre-band protection. There are a few good reasons and a whole lot of terrible reasons to do this, but again, I'm here to provide information, not judgment. Examples of these sorts of modifications would include adding an optic, using duckbill magazines, changing the stock to something with more modern features, or attaching a bipod. Kind of like this. As bizarre as it sounds, these actions are generally considered to constitute firearm assembly under the law and would result in a 922R non-compliant firearm. Near the end of this presentation, I'll talk about exactly how significant 922 violations may or may not be, but for now, we really just need to understand that that would be a violation, as the law is written. With that in mind, for now, let's entertain the possibility that you would prefer to comply with 922R, or at least would like to understand what compliance would look like, and you still want a modified SKS. One last time, we're going to go back to our Burger King metaphor. If you really want a Happy Meal, there are ways to get it but you need to swap out a few fries and apple slices. If you change one part on a 922R exempt SKS, the provisions outlined in 178.39 magically apply and you suddenly need to change at least four parts. So let's break that down. Of the 20 potentially countable parts established in 178.39, the ATF has established that 14 are present in a standard configuration SKS carbine. The Yugoslavian M5966 series includes 15 by virtue of its grenade launching muzzle device. That counts as a muzzle attachment. The parts which count towards a standard SKS configuration include the receiver, the barrel, the bolt, the bolt carrier, the gas piston, the trigger housing, the trigger, the hammer, the sear, the disconnector, the buttstock, the forearm, the handguard, the magazine body, and the follower. Once again, Yugoslav M5966 and 5966A1 rifles include a 15th part, which the ATF calls a muzzle attachment. So if you wanted to assemble an SKS in a non-CNR or pre-band configuration, that would be perfectly fine according to federal law, so long as you replaced four of the parts on this list with parts of US manufacture or five in the case of the Yugo. It's also worth mentioning that with the Yugo, you don't technically need to replace the muzzle device if you remove it, that will have the same effect. Remember that US parts don't count for you, it's only foreign made parts that count against you, and only if those foreign made parts are on this list. So let's look at that list again and rattle our way down to see which parts are and are not realistic to replace. Generally speaking, most people building a custom SKS aren't gonna be replacing their receiver, barrel, bolt, bolt carrier, or trigger guard. So that's a pretty much guaranteed five parts towards our total allotment of 10. In other words, most people will probably find it easiest to just look at this list of nine parts and pick four that they can replace. The gas piston is a fairly easy one. There's quite a few old Tapco gas pistons lying around and they seem to work fine as long as you can find one for a good price. Obviously that's a drop-in part, no gunsmithing required. The trigger, hammer, sear, and disconnector are all parts you can buy from Murray's gunsmithing, at least when they're in stock. And these all seem to work fine as well. The only thing with these parts is it will require you to disassemble and reassemble your fire control group, which isn't necessarily hard, but it's not a simple drop in installation either. Just as a brief additional note, some of you may be surprised to hear me recommending MERS products. I've made no secret in the past that I am absolutely not a fan of their so-called enhanced firing pin, and they've publicly made no secret uh, that that distaste is mutual. Make no mistake, I stand by my critique, and I actually look forward to doubling down on it. In a future video, they called me out, and I'm looking forward to responding. However, that doesn't mean that the guys at Murray's aren't skilled American machinists, and in my experience, their 922R compliance parts are good to go. Obviously, the buttstock and handguard usually come as a package and are super easy drop-in parts. So if you're trying to switch those, that can be a really easy way to bring that import total down if you're switching to a US-made stock. And finally, we have the magazine body and follower, which also count for two parts. So if, for example, you choose to set up your SKS with US-made duckbill magazines, that counts for two right there. And when you break it down like that, you see that should you choose to modify an SKS pattern in compliance with 922R, it's not that hard. A lot of guys switch to a US made stock, handguard and duckbill magazines. And as long as they aren't using a Yugo M5966 with an intact muzzle device, that right there would be 922R compliant. 
It's not a setup I particularly like, but if you like it, more power to you. As another example, above my head is a 922R compliant modernized SKS build I used for my Is the SKS Obsolete video, which is actually a bit of a harder setup because I insisted on using factory fixed magazines and an import Israeli made chassis. Obviously in this case, I did have to get into the internals and I replaced the trigger, sear, disconnector, and hammer with parts of US manufacture. Now I'm sure some of you are thinking, wow, what a terrible waste of money in order to comply with an asinine and unenforced law. And you may well be right. So let's get into the final section of this presentation, which is what are the consequences of violating 922R, why most people ignore this law, and why in this instance, I complied. The reality is that the vast majority of American firearm enthusiasts don't know about 922R, and among those that do, it's almost universally disregarded. To the best of my knowledge, there has not been a single incidence in American history in which an American citizen has been prosecuted for assembling a 922R non-compliant firearm for personal use. Right here on YouTube, you can find countless videos explicitly demonstrating the assembly or use of such firearms, including some from extremely high profile content creators. Given that these people are clearly getting away with it, it's reasonable for you to wonder how in a million years it could ever come back to bite you. After all, if someone can essentially rent a billboard saying, I violated 922R multiple times, filmed it, and uploaded the footage to the internet, many people would feel extremely comfortable just doing whatever they want because it couldn't possibly be any more risky than that, right? Again, these aren't trick questions. I'm really not here to tell you what to do. If you decide to ignore 922R, you are in good company and all legal precedents support you. For those who care why I personally have made the choice to comply with 922R, there are two very simple reasons. First, I'm filming myself. Call me a square, but I know how the internet works and I mind my P's and Q's whenever that red light starts blinking. Second, I have absolutely zero faith in the integrity of the United States Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. They have proven themselves to be an increasingly tyrannical regulatory body that makes a habit out of capricious policy reversals which are designed to intimidate and entrap people exactly like you and me. Just because they haven't historically enforced that law doesn't mean that it's not still on the books. And the statutory penalty for that level of federal firearm crime is up to five years in prison. My dad isn't the president of the United States, so if the ATF pulls a 180 and starts trying to pop people for this, I'm not counting on getting a sweetheart probation deal. One last time, I am not telling you what to do, nor sincerely do I care in the slightest. I'm only telling you that I have personally gotten increasingly convinced over the past few years that significant portions of my government are hell-bent on finding ways to recharacterize me from a law-abiding gun owner into a criminal, and the absolute last thing I'm going to do is hand them evidence on a silver platter. That's me. On an unrelated note, I'm sure that some of you viewers at home are thinking to yourselves, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. What would stop me from just laser engraving US on otherwise unmarked firearm components? How could the ATF possibly prove what configuration my firearm was in on November 30th, 1990, or 50 years ago to this date? And gee, you know what? Those are all really good questions. I've never personally put much thought into those, although I hold out the possibility that the competent professionals at the ATF have a magical crystal ball for that kind of thing. And that's the video, guys. Kind of a weird one, not a fun one, and actually left a bad taste in my mouth by the end, but I hope it cleared things up for those of you who asked. As always, thanks for taking the time to check out this video. If you found it to be helpful, entertaining, or otherwise worth the time you spent watching it, I would sincerely appreciate it if you could let me know by doing the YouTube algorithm stuff, aka hitting like, comment, and or subscribe. Thanks again, stay safe, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.